Good morning. It's time uh, to start the CareCast, uh, brought to you by the Knowledge and Evaluation uh, Research Unit at Mayo Clinic. I am Victor Montori uh, from the Care Unit, and today uh, we uh, we are in for a treat. Um, we are delighted to have uh, Isabel Boutouin uh, today as our guest of our, uh, our CareCast. Uh, Isabel is a professor of epidemiology at the University of Paris. Uh, she uh, heads the uh, methods team at INSERM, uh, uh, which is the Epidemiology Statistics Research Center at CRESS at INSERM, uh, which is, in my opinion, uh, one of the top two or top three uh, clinical epidemiology centers in the world. Um, she is also the director of Cochrane uh, France, and uh, is extremely active in the areas of uh, bias um, and the reporting of uh, clinical trials. Uh, 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 Isabel, what a pleasure to have you. Welcome to the CareCast. Thank you very much, Victor. I'm delighted to be here and uh, I'm sorry I'm from home in my uh, son's bedroom, but uh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is phenomenal. Um, the um, uh, we're we're just so happy to have you, um, Isabel. One of the ways we start this um, this conversations is to talk about the journey. You know how people have uh, come to be uh, who they are and where they are and how how they're doing things. And oftentimes it is helpful for some of the uh, younger people listening to know. You know, is this something that was designed? You know, this is the the path you set up to do, or to what extent uh, this is the result of uh, good luck uh, and fortune. So, so how does one become uh, Isabel Boutouin? Well, it wasn't planned at all. And uh, uh, it was really the results of good luck. And uh, I think meeting the right people and being able to grab the opportunity when they, they, they uh, occurs. So I was, um, you know, normal medical student with no plan. I was uh, becoming uh, willing to become a rheumatologist. I was thinking of having working in a private setting. And at the end of my studies, I, I was, yeah, after, yeah, three and almost four years of my, of my studies, I had the opportunity to do a master. Uh, and I had the opportunity to do this master um, supervised by Philippe Bravo, who became after that my mentor in the field of clinical epidemiology. And I just sort of realized that's where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. And so I sort of moved completely to uh, clinical epidemiology, uh, you know, stop everything I was doing and start again as a you know, master student, uh, stop working to do PhD student, didn't know where I was going where I was going, but just enjoying what I was doing. And then opportunity appeared uh, progressively because uh, I was enjoying what I was doing. So the work went quite well. And then some opportunity just arose, but it was just not planned at all. And I think it's just, you suddenly you meet some people and you realize that's where you need to go and just don't think and just go there. That's my advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, it uh, it was uh, sounds like it was particularly um, lucky uh, to have yeah. had in that first master's experience the opportunity to find something that really caught your imagination, and also um, you know a phenomenal uh, mentor like Philippe, right? I mean that that yeah. was the, that was a, a stress. But but you were not you were not satisfied with just um, with just that. Um, uh, you end the, you ended up going to Oxford. Oh, yeah. So that that was more planned. I sort of I had in my to do list, so, you know, uh, I did a to do list and in my to do list, I wanted to go abroad. I wanted to work to have the experience abroad because it's an experience I had when I was younger and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so I went to Oxford uh, after my PhD. And uh, again, I was very lucky because uh, first it was Oxford, which is uh, pretty nice. It sounds like a really uh, good was, place, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and second, and, and, and mainly, uh, I was working with Doug Altman, Professor Doug Altman, who is Professor of Statistics and uh, is a phenomenal uh, researcher. 
who did a lot, particularly for uh, improving the reporting of research, improving the quality of research, uh, moving toward responsible research. So for me, it has been a fantastic experience to be, uh, to be in Oxford. It yeah, was both said... a research experience and a family experience because I was there with all my family. You said that you, you had the experience of going abroad uh, at a younger age. Uh, where, where did you go? So well, actually, my dad did a postdoc and just sent me to his cousin because he didn't want me with him. And uh, I've got some cousins who were in the States, uh, in uh -huh. California. And I spent, uh, yeah, six months in, when I was 11. Uh, went to school, I couldn't speak a word on English at the beginning and just went to school. And that was fantastic experience. Oh, phenomenal! So then, then you moved your you moved your family to Oxford and uh, um, yeah. to to uh, and embed yourself in the English culture. Exactly. So that was uh, our goal. So we had some rules: you can't come, go back to France for one year, and you need to have the uh, perfect English life. So uh, children went to school, and we participated. Uh, in all the very British life with a British uh, a Christmas. And uh, so that was our, our British experience, yeah. Oh, what, what, was the most, what was the most British thing that you ended up doing? We went to the church uh, because there was sort of a, well, I think Christmas for me was very, it's very different uh, in, in, in England than in France. So having the proper British, uh, dinner my mom came to oxford to do a uh, christmas with us so that was a phenomenal experience and we did some punting so we, we tried everything we tried everything i can <laughs> tell you all the weekends we were trying everything <laughs> that is a wonderful uh, uh, adventure uh, uh dog oldman was uh, quite the character wasn't he the um um i i saw him for the first time in rome in 2000 and um and it, he was a scary character because he had big hair and big eyebrows. He looked like the devil. And, uh, and then you approached him and he was a sweetheart. You know, he was an extremely generous person. Yeah, he was fantastic. Very kind and uh, very busy, of course, but uh, you always had time for you. So you could go in his office. And it was just chatting, chatting about research for one hour, which is you know, incredible. I mean, it's a fantastic experience. So you had this desk with papers all over the desk and uh, you discuss research and suddenly you say, oh, I've got a very nice paper on this topic. And you just look in all the paper, all the pipes and find your fantastic paper. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a fantastic experience working with it. And uh, we also, I also had to learn to work uh, because uh, still it, it doesn't look, but there are some differences in uh, culture between the way we communicate in France and the way you communicate in, uh, in Britain. In France, we are quite direct. You know, if you've got something to say, you just say it, uh, which could be a, a bit rude in, uh, in England. So I had to learn to be much more uh, not so direct. So, so uh, in, uh, in uh, Doug Altman's team, there was uh, Sally Hopwell. And so she was my mentor. So she taught me how to write English emails, how to yeah, ask for uh, in a good way, to communicate in a good way and not to be so straightforward. So, the, uh, so Sally was your uh, cultural, uh, yeah. your, 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 your uh, uh, what would be your, your translator, your, uh, your cultural exactly. translator. Exactly. And then she came to France and so I became her French teacher. So how to did write she, did French. Did she become more direct? <laughs> <laughs> she became much more direct, yeah. <laughs> Which was we had that type of We had that type of conversation where she was, you know, talking for five minutes and at the end I would just say, Sally, just tell me what you want. <laughs> Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the more direct approach or the uh, the more, uh, what would be less direct approach that you do? I'm more comfortable with the more, most direct approach. For so me, you've, you've reverted natural. to your French uh, ways. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, is, that, is, that is great. Um, the uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, Doug Allman was interested in responsible research. You want to tell us, tell us a little bit more about what that means? 
so it it's it's uh, it worked a lot on um, uh, the bad quality of research actually it, it worked a lot showing that uh, we had a lot of waste in in the research we were conducting and we participated in a lot of paper related to that and the waste uh, arose at different levels first when you set up the research question where you're going to focus on on the wrong research questions and this is because for example you're going to use the wrong uh, comparator and there is a very nice paper that philip did on this topic where he looked at all registered randomized control trials in the field in, of rheumatology of rheumatoid arthritis and he showed that a lot of the trials compared the new treatment to a placebo and this is not ethical because there is some active treatment and you should compare the new treatment to an active treatment. And uh, so that's uh, an important waste in research. Another important waste in research was the wrong, choosing the wrong outcome, focusing on an outcome that is not relevant for patients, not uh, uh, clinically important. And that's also an important uh, waste in research. And of course, all the waste related to bad methods, uh, not reporting the results of research, or not being transparent in uh, reporting the results. So that was, yeah, uh, a lot uh, what he did. And, and I, I got really interested and, and really hooked by the, the topic. Do, do you think that the, the reason people end up pursuing this wasteful research, um, is it because they, they, they don't know how to ask those questions or is, is there something corrupting the way they're thinking about the questions? You know, is there something that is, that is affecting um, uh, their choice? Uh, for instance, I, you know, we published a paper on spin where we suggested that the choice of a wrong comparator had to do with the need to show that the new one was, was better and that had commercial implications and so forth. But what's your take? Why does, why does this uh, wasteful research happen? I think it's a mix. I, I think, I, I don't think, at least I would say for academic researcher, I don't think an academic researcher, uh, you know, wakes up and saying, thinking, oh, I'm going to do bad research to have a publication. I don't think so. I think, I really think they, they want to do a, a research, they want to do good research, but uh, I think there's an educational issue where they are stuck in their topic. I mean, very often they work in, uh, in fundamental research and they want to apply it to, uh, to uh, more apply research. And so what's interesting them uh, for their research, for their knowledge, what they really are interested in is very often surrogate markers mm. uh, and they completely forget the patient. So I think there's a, a mix of that and of course the need to have publication. And so uh, the need to have publication, which is sort of, you're not very conscious of it, well, you're conscious of it, but you don't probably don't realize how much it um, uh, influences the way you do research. Uh, and uh, and I think the the need of publications make them do a quick research and not and not so good research. So I think uh, yeah, I'm sort of a. But Doug Altman used to say, "I'm not a black and white man. I'm a gray man." And because you know it's not right or wrong. And I think it's, it's, it's quite a mix of, of different uh, uh, issue. And sometimes when you tell the researcher, well, this is not interesting of patients, you, you, they, they're not aware of it. They're not aware of the fact that the research they are doing is a waste in research. Yeah, the, um, uh, so you're very generous. Uh, I, I know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I knew you would say that. No, I think it's, it's. I think it's a bit of both. I. I don't. Yeah. But uh, I think it's not completely. Uh, now, when you try to convince them that it's bad research, uh, they are not very open to the discussion. I agree yeah, with you. I can imagine that. To that. Yeah. I. 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 I we've in, the, in our group we've discussed you know where questions come from and and we, we try to distinguish questions that come from a knowledge gap versus a question that comes from a practice gap. And in general, find it more compelling and perhaps it, it, uh, more useful to produce research that tries to address a problem in practice than, than the next step in knowledge. I think which is what one of the reasons you pointed out is this people enamored with their fundamental research, trying to bring it to the bedside and doing so still 
looking at mechanistic outcomes rather than than clinical mm, outcomes. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm working. On, sorry. No, no. I was just going to ask you. Um, it's it sounds like in your in your journey, um, there's been a lot of joy in 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 the work that you've done and working with great people. And uh, one a member of our audience is asking us if you think that. Uh, that what has uh, guided this path of, of, of enjoying your work, has it been working with the right people or pursuing the important questions? Oh, I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, uh, um, it's working with the right people because FIP have always got lots of uh, different ideas. And so it's very enthusiastic and very much uh, pushing you also, I mean, uh, uh, giving you opportunities. So that was working with the right people, but definitely the questions that were tackled within uh, his team and within uh, my team now were really, uh, I mean, the fact that you answer important questions, that you uh, look at research differently, that uh, I, I really like the idea of uh, trying to criticize uh, what uh, we are doing uh, on a, you know, everyday basis with no questioning. And I think, you know, stepping back and saying, oh, is this, is this a good way of doing it? Uh, and should we question what we are doing sometimes? I think it's, it's very stimulating because some, so suddenly you step back and you realize, oh, dear, that's all <laughs> that bad. <laughs> so there's a, a huge uh, amount of uh, improvement that is possible. It takes a particular personality to enjoy that aha moment where you, you realize, hmm, Maybe I was not thinking about it right. And then now in the discussion, all of a sudden it becomes clear to you. And when that happens, it's incredible pleasure, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, if, if you think about uh, a, a value, something that has been pushing your career forward, what, what do you think has been that uh, primary value that has been pushing you forward? So I think for me, there's two... Uh, not one, but two, uh, two uh, important things that uh, pushes me. First, I need to enjoy what I'm doing. So for me, uh, enjoying the work uh, I'm doing is, is really important. And I think when I was uh, practicing as a medical doctor, I was really enjoying what I was doing because I was, uh, you know, I loved the discussing, discussing with patients and taking time with patients. At the end of my study, the times with patients were getting shorter and shorter. So I was not so much enjoying what I was doing anymore, but, uh, and, uh, and then when I started doing research, I was really enjoying what I was doing and particularly uh, um, uh, collaborating with people and, and moving things forward. And I think the other thing is that I need to feel that it's useful. I need to think that uh, the work I'm doing uh, has, yeah, will be useful uh, in one way to, uh, to improve something. And uh, so I think I need to have the impression that it could have an impact. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't, sometimes if you try to think too much of it, um, you're not sure about it, but, <laughs> but yeah, for me, it's something that is important. It needs a sort so of a so meaning. It has, to, it has to be fun and it has to be useful. Now, yeah. fun, fun seems to me it's, uh, it's intrinsic. You sort of know when you're having fun. Uh, but useful is going to be always the judgment of someone else. How, how, do you, how do you realize that something that you're doing is useful? Is that something that you, you learn from your team or do you have other ways of, of getting to that conclusion? Well, it's probably wishful thinking, uh, you know. Uh, you think, well, possibly it could be useful. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, I think for me, it's important to think, well, possibly that could be useful, yeah. Um, and, uh, and again, if you, if you think, if you step back and you think about very critically, it's not very easy to, to say, well, is it really useful or, or not? So you never know. I mean, it's, it's sort of impossible to know. But at least you have the impression that it's trying to go in the good direction, I would say. It, um, um, uh, you know, we torture ourselves sometimes looking at the things that we've done and you know, you, you know, on a good day, you say, ah, yeah, this was good work, yeah, yeah. work. and then you're, oh, maybe, but only my mother has read it, and oh, that's not <laughs> so good. 
but uh, and then but then somebody discovers your paper cites it or brings it up at a conference or you see it somebody brings it up on twitter and I was like, oh, yeah. so sometimes uh, the, the the artist papers have a second life you know when somebody That's discovers right. yeah. them and become helpful and so those those are good moments aren't they yeah yeah definitely yeah uh, the um, uh, in our unit we have um, we have these three values: patient centeredness, integrity, and generosity. And I like to ask our guests if any of these uh, ring particularly strongly in in, in their soul. Uh, which of these uh, you know does it for you? So I think two uh, um, are important for me. Uh, again, too, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, probably when I think of my journey uh, at a different time point, so probably uh, integrity was the first uh, I was focusing on um, because that's what I tackled in my research and, uh, and, uh, and uh, worked a lot on this topic and was uh, more, uh, having more and more understanding about it. And then, and I think it's probably uh, thanks to the work particularly you did and some uh, other people did to highlight more uh, of the importance to be much more focused on patients that I sort of, but I, I must say, because I, I thought back about, uh, about this and I must say it was not at the beginning, uh, if I want to be uh, uh, honest, it was not at the beginning, I was not so much into uh, uh, I, at least I was not realizing how important it was. And it's more in the second step where I really realized that if you want to do good research, you can't do it uh, from the point of view of the researcher. You need to look to, to move to the point of view of the patients. And if you don't do that, uh, you won't do good research. And so I think progressively, this is how I moved to a, to a, um, a to patient-centered research. Uh, it's, it's really realizing that uh, to, uh, integrity was important, but uh, it's not enough to do good research. So, so let's, let's do both sides of that. Uh, let's start with the integrity bit, uh, the integrity focus. So you've done you know, important work in trying to identify what makes um, research and research reporting um, uh, how the, how the conduct and reporting of research enhances the value and the validity of that research, which eventually translates into more impact to patients, but downstream. Um, what's been your favorite uh, in that work? What, what's, uh, is there a particular part of that work focused on research and research reporting that uh, has a special place in your heart? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, probably the one I did with Doug Atman during my postdoc, uh, where we worked on SPIN. And, uh, and so, um, uh, because I, at, during this postdoc, I, um, you know, came with several ideas at the beginning. First idea, oh, yes, it's interesting, but think again. And then second idea, well, it's interesting, but think again. And so we had several meetings where, you know, I, I worked a lot for the meeting and then I had to think again. And then I came with the idea with, uh, on spin and, um, and he said, oh, I think it's not doable, but let's do it. And so we moved that forward. And, uh, and that was, yeah, really, really exciting. Yeah. And uh, the work was exciting. What about the impact of that work? I think it, work, uh, it, it had uh, uh, some impact because um, it was presented. So it was for me, it was, a, yeah, I, I had to present it at the peer review Congress, which is a very uh, impressive Congress. And uh, I was, you know, I, I think I, I had, I think 10 minutes to, to talk. And I think I must have practiced for hours and hours for these 10 minutes, I was so stressed. But, uh, but it went well and the people were quite uh, uh, positive about it and was published in, in JAMA. And then the people tried, reproduced and, and worked on the concept. So I think that was, uh, yeah, quite uh, a nice one, yeah. Yeah, um, I was trying to remember Isabel when we met and uh, in person the first time, and um, it was uh, uh, at, at, a, at a meeting that you had organized uh, to try to come up with better reporting for uh, non-pharmacologic uh, studies. And um, uh, as far as I know, I was brought in because PJ Devereux couldn't make it um, uh, because no. he 
you know, he was working on blinding and that sort of thing and I was helping out and this and that sort of thing but it was it was the first time I was in a room with uh, all the heroes of clinical epidemiology that you have brought in together to Paris and I remember we had a very nice uh, dinner at the bottom of the of the pyramid uh, in the Louvre um, which was a spectacular but I think that was the first time I, I met you and it was uh, just quite impressive group of people you brought in to, to develop those standards. It uh, must have been quite fun to put that together. Yeah, so it was, uh, well, at, at that time I was uh, still a PhD student. So it was mainly organized by Philippe Raveau. But uh, actually what we did, uh, I think we did not know personally most of the people in the room. We just did PubMed and took the, pick the people where you know, we like the papers and so you did a wonderful paper on, on blinding and uh, uh, that was uh, really, really interested and so we were delighted to, to, to have you and uh, there was all these people and there are a few, quite a lot of people where after the meeting, you know, the meeting you've got the scientific part and then you have the social part and uh, Philippe organized the social part in a wonderful way and so it was really an opportunity to create links with people where you just knew the papers but not the person and we had very strong collaborations with a lot of the people uh, in the room actually that was uh, a great experience yeah yeah i mean the, the people in that room were also quite you know there's a lot of common values there were a lot yes, of common values group, yeah right? yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah makes it fun um Let's talk about the other side. When the when you went to the uh, if this was a if this was Star Wars, you know, you went to the from the dark side to the light side. Uh, you know, when you, <laughs> when you when you turn from a research perspective, researcher's perspective to a patient's perspective, um, um, uh, what is what is that research like these days? What what is your patient focus research like these days? So I think I would because I've been thinking about about it um, and I think uh, the you did a presentation so I think you did a presentation at Evidence Live in Oxford yes. Philip went to this presentation and told us you need to look at the video and so we all looked at the video and it's and you were talking about uh, uh, burden of treatment and that's uh, where some people in the team really started working on uh, on the burden of treatment and, and move. We already had, I mean, we were already focusing more on, uh, on patient-centered research, but this was really sort of a, uh, a switch. And uh, I have one of my colleagues who worked a lot on, uh, on the burden of treatment, Tia Tranviet, and he collaborated with you. And, and then um, I had some people I know who did participate in clinical research and told me their experience and I was just appalled. I mean, it was, they had a very a terrible experience and appalling experience. And so I thought, well, perhaps there is minimally uh, um, uh, medicine, uh, but you could have also a, a burden for research for the patients and you could try to improve research and reduce this burden for patients. And yeah. so that's how we tried, started by doing a systematic review on qualitative studies, and we found very interesting results. Uh, so this, is the, this is the challenge of, uh, for uh, potential research participants to participate in clinical research and that the burden that that participation uh, would have on them, in addition to the fact that they, if they're participating, it's probably they have a condition, a condition that is being managed, self-managed, treated. So it's incremental to the burden exactly. of treatment exactly. for their condition. Um, uh, you said that, the, that, uh, that this was triggered in part by some appalling experiences. Without going into those, um, what, 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 does, what have you heard and what, what did you learn from the qualitative review that opened your eyes to the experience of participants to conduct, to, to conduct the research? So from the, from the systematic review, you could see how uh, stressful it could be for uh, patients when they learn that the treatment will be randomized. So what they will get uh, will be randomized. And I think that's uh, uh, for a lot of patients is extremely stressful and uh, with the, the fear to get the wrong treatment 
and, uh, and to lose chance because you get the wrong treatment. Um, and all the, uh, how painful it was for them, the ways the research were organized, where they were losing so much time just trying to find a way to get parking, a way to uh, waiting in the waiting room just to see a researcher who's going to collect data. And, uh, and, uh, and also one point that arose and that I think is also really important and that came back from uh, the, the experience is that when, uh, for example, the treatment does not work and the patients withdraw from the study, it can be extremely difficult for the patients because they were in a, in a specific environment. They knew people who were taking care of them. They had some hope of a treatment that might work. And suddenly we tell them, well, it doesn't work, bye-bye, you go back to usual care. And that can be extremely, extremely difficult. And I think um, most researchers don't realize uh, what it is to be a patient. And I think there's also a wrong feeling, a wrong understanding from researcher when I discuss with my colleague. They think that, um, because I keep asking them, well, if you, if you would be participating in this, in this trial, would you come at all the visits? And they always answer, but I don't have the condition and I won't be so much willing to participate in the trial. And so, and I think that's really this wrong impression uh, from the researcher that if you have the conditions, you're ready to do anything and, uh, and you've got time to do anything. And, that, and I think that's where we really need to train investigators and people doing trials and for them to really go on the, uh, have the other you know, vision of what it is to participate in a trial and to do only trials they would be happy to do, to participate in. Yeah, it's, a, it's an extension of the, some of the behaviors that um, patients have observed in, I mean, uh, let me put a parenthesis here. So this, this description that you've given us, is it mostly in cancer trials or is it in, in, in a range of trials? I think it's, a, well, my experience was in cancer trials, but I think it could be in any trial. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because I, I've noticed that in clinical practice, um, some cancer doctors, some of them who participate actively in clinical trials, you know, they, they implement protocols and they bring patients into studies, that when, when patients are not, when the treatment is not working for the patient, the first line treatment, then they try a second line treatment, uh, then they try the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh line treatment, yeah. and um, and uh, you know and and and, pa and the patient's well being, you know, the attention to their quality of life, the palliative care approaches, and things get pushed aside because we are on this track yes. of trying to yeah. beat the cancer. And I wonder if it's the same mindset that is that is coming from clinical practice to the clinical trial, or from the clinical trial to the clinical practice, where. If, if the goal is to beat cancer, what else could be more important than that? So, you know, we just assume that you as a, as a participant are willing to do everything and anything. Do you have that impression? Uh, I do, but I think it's not only related to cancer. I think okay. it's true in all severe disease because I had exactly the same type of experience for uh, very rare and very severe uh, rheumatologic disease where, I mean, the patients are ready, they, they will be ready to do, uh, to, to, to do anything because it's a severe disease and, uh, and completely forgetting that, so, well, you could, yeah, you need, to, you need to change your mindset. I think that's really important. And I think there's, for me, it's a lot of training um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a lot of training. Uh, I think- uh, A lot of training in what? I think in the training of um, medical students, in the training of uh, investigators, in the training of medical doctors who want to do clinical research, we need to for them to really change of mindset. Uh, and I think it will be both uh, good for the patients who will have a different experience, but also good for the research because they will do better research. Yeah, yeah. It's, um... It, it seems at, a, at, a, at the core level, almost like a failure of empathy uh, yeah. or, or an excessive amount of empathy with future patients, because that's the other thing is that you sometimes commit to a particularly okay. difficult protocol because you're trying to improve 
the value and validity of the research you're doing now so you can benefit future patients. Uh, and maybe you have a, too much of a commitment to the future patient and too little of a commitment to your participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. The, um, um, one of the, um, um, what, one of the, uh, one of the angles, of course, that you've described is the stress of being randomized to the wrong thing. And then you, you went uh, to the other end, which is if at the end of the study, either because the, 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 the randomly allocated intervention didn't work or the study finished, the people exit the study protocol, exit the study team, exit the study relationships that might have carried the patient over a period of time. There is a, you're the head of Cochrane, uh, France. There's a Cochrane review that is often used uh, to justify inviting patients into clinical trials that indicates that on average, patients that participate in clinical trials get better care than patients who do not participate in clinical trial. It sounds like that, that was a very superficial review given the, the, the discussion we're having now. Um, yeah, that's it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, I think they might have sort of a, um, I mean, they have more follow up, more visit, and so they, they might have sort of a uh, more treatment and be better uh, taken care of for, on some part. But it, it doesn't mean that their quality of life during this, this period will be much better, and whether the long term effect will be much better. So. I think, I mean, when we did the, um, the systematic review on qualitative study, we also had some patients uh, highlighting the good of experience they had uh, when doing research. And, 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 and very often these patients also highlighted the difficulty when this, the study ends, because all the context of the study, because uh, probably the team was good and was uh, uh, empathic and took uh, well care, when the study suddenly finished and they go back, that's where they uh, they had they had the difficulties. So yes. so it's not black and white again, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's more. Uh, uh, I think we we can definitely do much better. I think we probably when you just like look at the number of visits uh, where you ask the patients to come to the hospital, while it probably could be done from home, completing questionnaire. The number of questionnaires you ask them to to fulfill, which is just you know impressive, I think all this could be uh, could definitely be simplified and and make uh, the burden for, for patients much um, much lower. Do you um, do you, what is your impression about the value of having patients as co-investigators uh, in the study process from the design from the identifying the question designing those those study procedures, uh, perhaps even designing the, 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 the coming off the study process and so forth. What, 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 have you had experience with that? What, what is your sense of it? So I had experience with that and it worked very well. Um, my sense of that is, um, uh, I think it's important to do it, but I don't know how to do it well, if you want. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, uh, sort of statement, there must be what we call patient and public involvement. And it's even a box to tick, uh, for example, in the UK to get some funding, you need to tick the box patient and public involvement. And I think a lot of investigators just put the name of patient. We have the patients and public involvement and that's done. And then you have some uh, patients group that become professional of patient and public involvement. So I is this the right patients to involve and to help designing the study? I don't know. Uh, it should be, should it be very often, it's a small number of patients that is involved with a lot of physicians. So do they really have a voice? I'm not sure. Um, or sometimes you could have the opposite with where a patient will have a very, very strong voice and, uh, and, and perhaps not, uh, I mean, I. I must. I. I think it's important to do, but I think we need to work on how we do it. And I'm not sure having just one or two patients. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's comfortable. Oh yes, we did uh, involve some patients. You're comfortable. I did. I did the right thing. But I'm not sure we really know how we should do it. And I think we definitely need to work on what is the best way to involve patients. And my feeling is that it should be a lot of patients that are involved to help uh, constructing a study and not 
a limited number of patients that might have high knowledge in um, methodology, but will have a specific point of view and might not represent the point of view of all the patients. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need, and probably the point of view that the patient will have in one setting might be completely different if he leaves uh, one hour from the hospital or if he leaves two hours uh, from the hospital, uh, according to his job, according to, I mean, there's lots of, uh, it's not one patient, it's lots of lots of different people with a huge diversity of uh, value of uh, what is important for them. And, uh, and I think, yeah, we need to find good ways to involve patients. I think having the angle of, of the burden of participation uh, is an angle that makes uh, the uh, adds to uh, the, the, the richness of that involvement. Because I, like you, I've been involved in situations where the patient's voice is brought in to tick a box, like you, like you mm -hmm. say, um, or where we're just asking for general impressions. You know, what do you think of our questionnaire? What do you think of our mm -hmm. procedure? You know, and he just says, but I think the angle of, of how, how easy or difficult or where do you think there will be some friction or some pain points or some, what additional care would people need as they go through this that mm. is not in our protocol and perhaps even not paid by the study and so forth. This may become really practical questions and, and your, your, your proposal that we don't have just a few patients but we have a large number of people that represent um, or are similar to the patients that we are going to be enrolling uh, seems uh, quite interesting. I don't know the situation in France about this. Um, uh, uh, as you know, I have my suspicions, but I, I do not know <laughs> it. Uh, is in, in relation to the notion of diversity and inclusion. Um, there is a, uh, um, I think, a very welcome development in terms of um, uh, having a more, more diverse uh, workforce in, in, in clinical practice, a more diverse workforce in research, um, and, and certainly a, a more diverse and uh, uh, set of participants in clinical research so that we have greater confidence that our results apply more broadly um, uh, as we, we come up with them. Um, the issue of burden of, of participation in research seems to me will be one that will interact uh, quite strongly with um, factors that contribute to the discrimination of, of people in general in society, uh, but also discriminate against them in their ability to participate in care and their ability to participate in research. Have you have you gone into into that space and, and what what have you what what insights have you developed? Uh, we didn't go in. Well, we tried to. Um, explore what would be the, the willingness of patients in terms, for example, of organization of, of research. So we did sort of a, a survey where patients, um, uh, we use protocol, uh, industry protocols of, of randomized control trials, and we created a vignette describing the protocols and proposed to the patients a different uh, organization of uh, so they could sign the consent form from home or sign it at the hospital. They could come at all the visits at hospital, some at hospital, some at home or all from home and at the end of the study. And what we could see that there was a huge diversity. And so there's not one uh, uh, type of uh, organizations that will, uh, would please most of the patients. And so I think we definitely need to, to think of the way we do research to be much more flexible. Uh, that's my point of view. And it's quite, it would, you know, it's a huge change in the way people organize research because they don't like uh, flexibility in research. You hate it, it needs to be completely organized. And I think we, we can make it organized, but also low some flexibility and uh, what we will lose by the flexibility, we might gain it on other aspects where patients might be more willing to stay in the study, might, might be more willing to participate in the study. And we showed in this, with this vignette that if you organize the study uh, according to the preference of patients, uh, you have much more patients who would accept to participate, would be happy to participate. 
So, um, so I think it's uh, yeah, it's it's a big change in the way. But I think the diversity of the of the patients and and we need this diversity in trials because otherwise we're going just to include always the same patients living next to the hospital uh, in this specific setting. Uh, I think this diversity will bring a lot to the trials uh, and, uh, and, and will be very useful. If you go beyond biological diversity and you start looking at uh, social um, factors, uh, um, you know, country of origin, um, ethnicity, um, cultural differences, um, even gender, um, have you have you have you interacted with with the with the efforts to try to improve that that form of diversity as well? Uh, not so, I must say not not so much. Uh, I think we always try to discuss it with the investigators. Particularly um, currently, you know, in France we're a bit behind, but currently we're fighting on age because they tend to exclude uh, uh, more um, age uh, patients. So we try to stop exclusion criteria that have no sense at uh, uh, excluding patients because they, again, I think it's because they are in a very, in, in a specific um, context. I mean, they, they imagine the trials related to their uh, own research and uh, forget that it's, it's very an apply research. And, uh, and so they're going to add a, a huge number of exclusion criteria for the patients. And so we try to, to fight a little bit uh, on that when we plan the trials. Um, we've, we've gone a little bit through, you know, the integrity and the quality of research, talked a little bit about the patient perspective uh, and how taking that in, uh, might make uh, clinical research better. Um, when I was introducing you at the, at the top of, uh, of our talk, of our conversation, um, I mentioned a number of administrative positions. And I, I wonder, I wonder about that. Is is is, is um, in your, you know, you seem to enjoy research quite a bit. Are are taking these administrative positions a, a curse, a, a bad thing, or a natural evolution? Something that people should be jumping at the opportunity to do, or, or something you have to do because you're a you're you're a team player? What's your what's your sense about this this appearing evolution towards taking positions in administration? Well, I must say uh, the life when I was a PhD student and uh, um, postdoc student was, you know, the most wonderful time. I mean, if you have in the audience, if people are PhD or postdoc, just, you know, grab it and, you know, enjoy. Uh, afterwards, of course, you have new uh, responsibility. Um, I, I still, I mean, uh, you learn a lot with this responsibility and you enjoy uh, part of it, not all of it. Um, I think, for example, uh, uh, having the responsibility of other researchers, trying to help them doing their career, uh, supervising them is really, uh, um, yeah, enjoyable. I mean, it's very, very interesting. And having the interaction uh, with the junior researchers is, is really interesting and rewarding. Um, so my, my strategy on that was to do it the latest possible to take all these responsibility. But now I've got no choice. I, 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 can't, I can't push them anymore. Uh, so I just have to take them. But uh, because that's part of uh, what you say, a team player, you, you, you need to, uh, at one point, you need to do your, um, uh, your part. But yes, my, my strategy was really to push it. And I was quite lucky because I was able to push it uh, quite, uh, quite for, for a while. And, yeah. not to take, and I'm not taking responsibility I don't want to do. So for some of them, if I, unless people tell me, well, there's no choice, we need someone to do it, uh, I would do it. But if there's some responsibility that might be rewarding in terms of title, in terms of position within the university, but, uh, but I know that it will mean uh, stopping a lot of the research I'm enjoying, uh, I will try not to take it as much as possible, yeah. So that's more my strategy about that. So, so now that you have those, those, uh, the opportunity of those responsibilities, um, uh, what are you doing with it? Are you doing something crazy? Is there something, uh, something unusual with it? Are you, are you um, trying to create a different, different set of environments or other things? Are you? Do you have a particular mission that you're after? 
so it, it depends on the responsibility. For, currently, the research team, it's still Philippe Rabot with there, so it's, it's, it's a bit different. Cochrane, I'm trying to, yeah, to, uh, to find my way to, uh, to understand the system because it's a huge system. And, and then to try to move forward the project or ideas or way, way of doing that I think could be uh, different as, for example, for Cochrane uh, uh, in the context of COVID, we did a platform where we identify all randomized control trials, collect data and uh, put the analysis uh, online as soon as uh, they're done. So every week we redo the analysis and we give it to the, and that's very unusual. I mean, that's not Cochrane classical way of doing. And so we tried to push, but they were quite open. And I think, uh, um, and so we tried to push yeah, other way of, uh, of doing it, yeah. Hmm. Cochrane has a, a relatively new area on sustainable, uh, sustainable medicine uh, that yeah. has caught my attention because it um, seems like an extension of not only doing sustainable research, in other words, uh, research that is useful, that is not wasteful, um, that answer questions that matter and do so in ways that don't waste patients' time, energy or attention, right? Yeah. So more yeah. of a kinder form of research for patients, more minimally disruptive. Um, and uh, are you involved in that effort at all, or uh, have you? Has it come under your 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 purview? Within Cochrane, I don't think so. No. It, it's a, yeah. It's a, it's a field. It's a Cochrane field on sustainable sustainable medicine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it seems it seems like uh, it might be a potential point of interaction with uh, yeah, absolutely, with, absolutely. With this work. Yeah. Um, COVID has changed everything, right? It's uh, it's interesting yeah. because uh, the the last time we saw each other in person. Um, it was just right after the uh, the Notre Dame had uh, you know had that uh, fire yeah. and uh, yeah. and uh, everything was closed. The, the uh, your office, uh, which is right next door, had uh, residues of the of the smoke uh, come on the yeah. plants yeah. in the beautiful uh, in garden there, um, and uh, and you know. I remember the pictures, uh, T sent me some pictures from the window and you could see the fires, you know, and, the, and you couldn't imagine a, a bigger disaster and such a, such a jewel, an architectural jewel uh, and set a, such a symbol of Paris. And then COVID hit, you know, it's like, oh, you don't think of, <laughs> you cannot think it'd be worse. Oh, here's worse, right? Uh, uh, how, how, has, uh, how has the dy dynamic changes brought about by COVID in terms of, for instance, our, the ability to interact more broadly electronically and so forth, how has that changed way the one, the way your team is working, but also the way you're imagining the, the future of research to be? Uh, so it changed completely the way uh, we are working within the team because we were locked down in March and we are currently still locked down, so still working from home. And so it's only online interactions. Uh, I must say for the team, it's, I think it's, it's problematic because it's very difficult. And, um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, have a new face-to-face -face meeting where I mean, the interaction is much easier. You can you can interact much easily, and uh, you can uh, yeah see see the face and see uh, you know the body language of the people uh, uh, much easily. So so uh, for me, uh, the work from uh, home and uh, through video uh, is not the optimal way of doing research. It works very well for um, for a lot of things, and you 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 gain a lot of time. That's for sure. But there is also a lot of interaction, which is, you know, the, the not the the interaction that happens but was not planned, and this interaction is research that happens but not was not planned is really important, and it's really when you have lunch, <laughs> when you take a coffee, when you uh, go outside and uh, discuss, and uh, and it's that's and that's for me it's really a, a difficulty for currently for research. Yeah, we've we've our team has been apart also since since March, and we um, we meet uh, every every morning uh, for a few minutes um, to check in. And uh, when things were relaxing a little bit, we we had uh, a, a 
small group uh, come together outside with a fire, you know, in the oh, middle. You know, so <laughs> we can have those. But it, there, I think we're all hungry for the same moments that you're describing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the same room, and it, uh, it you know, uh, maybe maybe it's just more fun. Maybe it is just the more in, more of the serendipity, more of the chance discussion that come in. Yeah. I think it affects creativity. Um, I think yeah. it affects the range of ideas and the and the the, the, the extent to which you can uh, uh, listen to each other without taking turns and uh, you know this yeah. the craziness of the personal interaction. Uh, so it's it's a bit sad uh, that uh, in addition to all the deaths uh, and the and the difficulties with uh, Ill, Ill, illness and so forth, the isolation, the separation, and the and mm. the cost this will have on on people's careers um, as uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Sort of significant. Um, uh, having been with your group in person, um, uh, uh, it, it's a wonderful chemistry that you have, and uh, I'm sure it. Uh, I'm sure they all miss it tremendously to be in the room with you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's really a, a difficulty, but uh, hopefully we'll come back a little bit with mask and. <laughs> and vaccines and uh, vaccines yeah That's... yeah hopefully that will happen soon um we're getting to the end of our time and um and one of the things that i think is always interesting in, when when we talk to in talking with you but in, in talking with other people like you in this series has been to ask people what's next what's coming what was the big next adventure uh for isabel Bouton? What, what what's what's next for you uh, I, I don't know. I mean, more uh, more uh, responsibilities, I think. Uh, so uh, so I need to to think how I'm going to to take over this these responsibilities, um, and uh, and hopefully uh, maintain uh, sufficient uh, time for research. Uh, I think currently I'm quite uh, very much involved in, in to Cochrane and to meta research, research on research. And so I think that's where I really want to, uh, to continue uh, investing, particularly in, uh, in meta research and continue this, uh, uh, you know, uh, self uh, criticism. But I like, what I like in meta research is that you criticize what um, is being done, but you criticize also what you're doing yourself. Otherwise it's a bit uh, too easy. So, so I think that's, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's what I'm, going to, to, to plan doing. And my goal is really to, to try to, to still have time to collaborate on research projects, to uh, uh, work with people like you and internationally and, uh, and uh, to continue uh, enjoying really the research we're doing. That's uh, my goal. Yeah, well, if, <laughs> if, uh, if life is, uh, if, is, uh, is teaching us anything is that um, uh, you have to leave a little bit of room for that uh, surprise uh, opportunity that comes up, uh, because sometimes they come with a lot of fun, and uh, yeah. yeah, and that's um, I am glad, very glad that uh, that you found the paper in PubMed that let uh, you to invite me that first time to Paris. <laughs> that was I, great to have you. Yeah, I'm very glad that Philippe uh, brought the video and. Uh, and help us come together to work uh, with the, for instance, on the burden of treatment questionnaire, all that work, and and to work with you on re uh, research reporting and minimally disruptive research. And um, you know, the collaboration between our group uh, has been very good and uh, a lot mm -hmm. of fun. Uh, yeah. With the, the, yeah, think, definitely. Yeah, the the hallmark of working with you, and um, and I am I'm so so happy that someone with um, with your commitment to integrity research and uh, and collaborative research and and fun helpful useful um, uh, useful research uh, is in the positions of leadership and in a, in a capacity to shape uh, how uh, the next uh, generations of researchers are going to um, uh, move us forward. So. Um, uh, Isabel has been a wonderful pleasure chatting with you today, uh, help, helping others uh, learn what I know of, of you and, uh, and to hear from you um, how you see the world, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much for, for coming to the Kirkas. Well, thank you so much for this invitation. It's been a pleasure discussing with you and, uh, and uh, hopefully we will have uh, other collaborations soon. Looking forward to those. And thanks everyone for joining us today. 
Uh, we hope to see you next week in the in the care cast uh, from from uh, the care unit and Mayo Clinic. Um, until next time, and please take care. Thank you.